chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her, and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised and thanked God. But the leader in charge of the synagogue was indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd. Come on those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord replied, you hypocrite, you work on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from their stalls on the Sabbath and lead them out for water? Wasn't it necessary for me, even on the Sabbath day, to free this dear woman from the bondage in which Satan has held her for 18 years. This shamed his enemies, and all the people rejoiced at the wonderful things he did. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And so may the words that I speak and the thoughts of all our hearts always be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. I've actually got two scriptural quotes for this morning, two biblical texts rather than one. First one, of course, is from the reading we've just had, the verse 16 of this, of this chapter of 10 of St. Luke. Wasn't it necessary, even on the Sabbath, for this woman whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years to be set free? And secondly, a passage from St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 27. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Well, this morning we're directed to concentrate on St. Luke's account of this healing of the woman crippled for 18 long years. And what I'd like us to do is to consider carefully all the parties that are featured in the account. Think really hard about each one of them. I wonder if you noticed how many people, or groups, personalities whatsoever, are involved within the seven verses we've just heard. I counted up seven, and actually I came to eight, um, one includes, if one includes the source of the story. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to work through the entire cast, like a kind of dramatis personae from a play. But of course, this is no play, it's true, biblical history. Number one, of course, is our Lord Jesus himself who heads the list. Secondly, there's the woman crippled for 18 years, crippled, we're told quite clearly, by evil. Number three, of course, is almighty God himself. You remember he was praised and thanked by the woman. Then we've got the the leader of the synagogue, a real Puritan type if there ever was one, and still about, I'm sorry to say. Um, number five, Satan, the evil spirit, wickedness personified, the devil himself, what we call the fallen archangel Lucifer. Number six, we've got Jesus' opponents. They're actually called enemies in some of my Bibles. And lastly, there's the crowd, the people, the congregation, that is, those who rejoiced at the very end of the account. And as I say, let's also keep in mind the person who supplied us with the story, St. Luke himself, the evangelist, described by St. Paul in his letter to the Colossians as his dear and beloved physician. Very important to St. Paul. Um, And so we know that St. Luke was a medical man and he's clearly got a very special interest in recording matters of healing. And so this story, this account, comes from one um, who is a physician, a doctor, and who stated at the beginning of his gospel account, it would be a diligent and orderly account, carefully prepared, and it was for a certain high Roman official who we don't know very much about, whose name was Theophilus. So the passage opens with Jesus' teaching. And of course, it's the Sabbath day. 
It's actually the last time we hear him teaching in a formal context in one of the synagogues in this gospel. And perhaps I think the reason is that he was becoming increasingly unpopular with the religious authorities. And of course this story, this passage, reveals one reason why. Now I don't think I've ever heard in all the years I've been going to church um, a sermon preached about courage. But courage was certainly necessary today and Jesus doesn't duck the issue when the um, matter comes up before him. And that's because basic fundamental understanding of one of the ten Jewish commandments was at issue here. It was understood, as you know, as forbidding work on the Sabbath day. I rather reckon the traditional biblical words provide us with a rather better guidance. The ones that you and I were brought up with, the ones that say, remember thou keep holy the Sabbath day. That's the sense of holy being set apart. Remember, keep holy the Sabbath day. And so Jesus immediately confronts the issue head on. He takes action immediately because he sees, he perceives need. The results of evil done to the woman are apparent to him the moment he sees her. First and foremost, he heals her. And words of exclamation only come afterwards. But remember, only only after he's criticised. And you remember, his criticism was very public too. I can recall back in the days when I'd still got some authority in the workplace and um, being taught a golden rule by the area manager. Frankie said, remember always, praise in public, but reprimand in private. It was always a good rule to remember. So we've got very two public reprimands to consider today. The first from the leader of the synagogue, and I'll come to him in a moment. But before that, we need to consider number three in our list of characters, and that is, of course, the woman herself. We don't even know her name. But St Luke, to emphasise perhaps the enormity of the miracle, tells us that she's been crippled for no less than 18 years. And Scripture makes it crystal clear that some, time, some kind of evil had caused her to be crippled. Jesus himself declared it was Satan that had kept her bound for 18 long years and she couldn't even stand up straight. And unlike other accounts of Jesus' healings, and of course there's lots of them, she does not seek out Jesus herself. No. And of course, and that must be because um, she was acutely aware what the rules were, the Sabbath rules. Um, and so, rather unexpectedly, unusually, it's Jesus who calls her over to him. And straight away, too, you remember, the moment he sees her, what were the words? Woman, you are healed. In my version of the New International Bible, um, it uses the words set free. I prefer that, you know, delivered, isn't it? Delivered from evil. And you remember the instant healing uh, comes about by means of Jesus' personal touch. Touch, of course, is one of those senses which can be more than it first seems. Don't we sometimes speak of being deeply touched? Things put right inside us when nothing physical has actually happened at all. And the touch of Jesus not only brought instant healing but recognition from the woman that Almighty God, God himself, was at work. God was a source of her deliverance, the fourth personality on that list I spoke about a moment ago. Verse 13 tells us how she praised and thanked God, recognising, of course, that all goodness, all health, all healing come ultimately from Almighty God. She recognised that and she rejoiced. She wasn't to know, of course, drawing on the much later words of St. Paul, that the Christ who had just healed her, Christ himself was and is the visible image of the invisible God. The visible image of the invisible God. Nor indeed, of course, did character number five, the leader of the synagogue, he'd got absolutely no idea of the true nature of 
of a visiting teacher. And in these words, for me at least, we've got evidence for what that great biblical scholar, J.B. Phillips, calls the, the ring of truth, the biblical ring of truth. And I think it's worth thinking hard about the character of this individual because what we discern about him, sadly, is only true, true to life. Because unhappily, sadly, even people of faith sometimes display signs of fallen human nature, even though, even though they've apparently chosen a righteous way of life. They've become sour. Perhaps their authority and their power has corrupted them. When I was working for the Children's Society for 15 years and I went to a different church every week, I came across <laughs> some very interesting clergy sometimes, but also some enormously committed ones. But it's true to life, isn't it? As we say, it's got a ring of truth. And there's nothing new in the kind of Puritan personality um, person, per, personified by this leader of the, the synagogue. Um, you remember the description in our, our Living Water Bible was indignant he was. And I've got two other words that I found in, in, in my other translations. One was angry, and better still, pompous. Sums up the situation for us. And I, I'm sure, I hope you notice how he went about his criticism. He doesn't go quietly and take Jesus on one side and question his action. Oh no, he doesn't seek an explanation. He doesn't do that at all. He addresses his criticism to those who had come to the synagogue to learn from this teacher and to worship God. So just think about, picture the situation for a moment. Jesus doesn't hesitate. You remember his words? You hypocrite, he says. Quite devastating criticism. Don't you even tend your animals on the Sabbath day? And again, going back to some of my other Bibles, the word is in the plural in nearly all my other translation, you hypocrites. Rather looks like the leader had some rather similar-minded legalistic colleagues in tow, fellow hypocrites, blind leaders. What does the proverb say? Birds of a feather? Very good, Rosemary. Birds of a feather flock together. At Upton Church, where I occasionally lend a hand still, they're looking at one of the study groups of the Book of Proverbs. I've never studied the Book of Proverbs, but occasionally there is great wisdom to be found there. And it's quite clear that this group, led by the, the leader of the synagogue, put this entire literal emphasis um, on the rule itself, not, not the righteousness that it was intended to bring about. Judaism, as we probably all know personally, has not been the only religion to succumb to making the danger of rules and regulations and traditions more important than the individual. Certainly in my upbringing, my Catholic upbringing, there were an awful lot of rules and regulations. And only we got a little bit older and asked the uh, <laughs> RE teacher at 15 or 16 some rather questions about sex and what was allowable and what was a sin wasn't, he said, You'll have to work out that for yourself. There comes a time when we have to think things out for ourselves. And so, as we know, Christianity sometimes has fallen short um, um, uh, over the way it, it puts its uh, um, rules and regulations into practice. Perhaps we might say not enough um, careful thinking has been done. And what we need to do is to look behind the rules and regulations and apply the kind of teaching that our Lord gave when he declared Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And you remember that Jesus had declared quite categorically that the Son of Man, and that was one of his favourite ways of describing himself, that the Son of Man was Lord even of the Sabbath. And so the Lord of the Sabbath declares some memorable and highly telling words to those who rebuked him for the healing. He said, wasn't it necessary to free this dear woman? It wasn't merely permissible, it was absolutely necessary. It was highly appropriate to liberate men and women from evil, from the reign of Satan. And so, of course, that brings us very neatly to the sixth individual on our list, Satan <coughs> excuse me, himself, <coughs> the prince of this world, as Jesus describes him, the very devil himself. 
If you remember your Gospels and Luke's Gospel, earlier there's a passage when Jesus tells the disciples that he'd seen Satan fall from heaven as a flash of lightning and, of course, become a fallen angel. It used to be a prayer I was taught as a child about um, the devil and all those wicked spirits that wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Well, we've all encountered them, haven't we? I doubtless um, reached the seventh party on our list. Um, it's a group that the verse 17 refers to um, uh, Jesus' Jesus's enemies, opponents in some, but enemies in others. And of course, they were guilty of this great sin of pride, the deadliest of sins, and their pride in their certainty of being right has led them badly astray. They clearly had a love of status, of authority and of power, and these are things that we perceive in the likes of the leader of that long gone synagogue. But Jesus, by his healing words and actions, his clear explanation has shamed them. His adversaries were made ashamed of themselves. That's what one of my translations says. I prefer that to shamed. I think it gives us hope that hearts were changed and condemnation were turned to rejoicing. And rejoicing, of course, is exactly what we hear from the ordinary people. Rejoicing at the wonderful things that Jesus did. In defeating the evil work of Satan manifested in the crippled woman, Jesus showed not a slavish attachment to the letter of the law, was, was obeying the fundamental purposes lying behind it. It was necessary, especially on the Sabbath, for the woman who had kept bound for 18 years to be set free. And of course, our task too is similarly to work against evil, to defeat it with love and caring, and it's absolutely to practice this kind of love every day, and not just on the Sabbath, not just on Sundays. But the Sabbath as we've heard today, is the day that we're reminded of the priority of these things. We are to work at them seven days a week, renew our Christian commitment, and imitate those that St. Luke told us about in the closing verse of that passage. And all the people rejoiced, rejoiced at the wonderful things he did. And so let's remember that and do just the same thing ourselves. Thanks be to God. Amen.